Good evening, everybody. It looks like we've got plenty of you uh, joining us live now this evening, so we'll get things underway. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for tonight's presentation about medicine and sports science in amputee football. Uh, we're really pleased to have Elizabeth Aitchison and Niall Hogan here from the England amputee football team presenting this evening, uh, a physio and a GSR, so we've got equal representation from both sides. Before we do get underway, I'm just going to run through a little bit of housekeeping so that you know how the session is going to run tonight and you know how to ask any questions, etc. So please do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know uh, what professional background you're from and where in the world you're tuning in from this evening, because it's always great to see the diversity of people attending these sessions. We are going to send certificates of attendance out to everybody that's joining us live. So if you are watching this on the recording, unfortunately you won't have one produced but if you are with us right now we'll be sending you one out the presentation is going to be 30 40 45 minutes something around that kind of length and then we're going to follow that up with a q a so if you do have questions please put them into the q a rather than the chat we'll monitor those as we go through and if there's a some if there's a question somebody's already asked that you like the look of please upvote it and it'll bump it to the top that just gives it the most chance of it being answered we will make the recording available, uh, be out there for a limited time, and we're going to send everybody the link. Before I hand you over to our guest speakers this evening, just a little word on BASRAT. Uh, we're the Professional Association and Regulator for Sport Rehabilitators. And for nearly three years now, we've been running these CPD webinars regularly. So if it is your first time joining us, welcome, and please stick around for some, uh, some more in future. If you do want to support our work and be part of our organisation, you can do that by joining as an associate member and you can see the benefits there up on the screen. It's five quid a month and we'll send you out a link with some more information after this evening's webinar. Uh, I will stop sharing my slides. Uh, I'll hand you over to the, to the main event for this evening, which is uh, Elizabeth and, and Niall. So over to you guys. Thanks, Ollie. So welcome, everyone. I just want to thank everyone again for joining. We're really excited to be sharing our story um, at the England Amputee Football Association to talk all things medical. We'd like to thank Ollie for giving us the opportunity to partner with Basra as a platform to celebrate disability sport and give some insight into the different opportunities and inclusivity of football. The things we're going to discuss are the England Amputee set up, our medical team and the things we get up to to give you a brief insight on how we operate at an incredibly elite level for a charitable organisation. So first of all, we'll just introduce ourselves. My name's Elizabeth Aitchison. I'm a physio by background, as Ollie said. So I studied at UConn and graduated in 2018. I then went straight on and did my sports medicine masters also at UConn. While I was doing this, it was pretty rough. I did um, and my NHS rotations as soon as all my exams are out of the way. So doing my dissertation at the same time um, at the leading Northwest Heart and Chest Hospital. During this time, also, I can't shout loud enough about UCLAN because the opportunities when I did the sports med program there that they allowed me to get. So working with some um, championship and Premier League Academy clubs. So there's Preston North End, Manchester United. And then we had the opportunity to go and be venue medical man managers at the Gibraltar NatWest 2019 Island Games, which was just incredible. So then my experience from the England Amputee football team was when I moved to London and um, it was 2021. And I seen an advert on Twitter that was shared by the CSP because they were looking for a chartered physio to join the travelling squad to go to Poland to the Euros. And that is where I met Niall and the rest of the team. Um, after we'd done the championships, we were sort of in a transitional phase, like the team, the players and the staff. And we all liaised and realised we'd need a lead position for the medical team as we transition to the next season, because that was going to be preparation for the World Cup. And luckily, I attained that role. So then we just progressed from there. Um, currently in London, alongside the England amputee stuff, I work as a locum physio, because this allows me the flexibility to give my time to the England um, volunteering as part of the charity. It also allows me to do sessional stuff at Chelsea Academy and also continue my learning. So I recently did a um, um, module on the football and science rehabilitation um, masters at UCAM. I'll hand you over to now. So my name is Niall Hogan. Um, 
a graduated sports rehabilitation um, from Bolton University in 2019. Um, had a really amazing time at Bolton Uni, some really good opportunities, um, kind of obviously my learning, clinical placements and sporting placements, um, and just the environment at the university really helped me thrive um, as a student and made me the rehabilitator I am today. Um, during my second year at uni, I joined the England Amputee Football Association, um, and I've been working there ever since. Uh, during my four and a half years uh, with the group, uh, I've worked within the club teams in the league setups. Um, I've done the junior programmes, uh, development squads, uh, and the senior national team as well. And with the senior national team, I had the pleasure of joining um, as the rehabilitator for the European Championships last year in 2021. Uh, and for the World Cup earlier this year um, as my first two major tournaments. Outside of my work within England, um, I've been working in private practice since I graduated uni, uh, originally starting at the Bingley Physiotherapy Practice up until around the pandemic time. Um, and then I moved through to Whitehall Physiotherapy and Sports Rehabilitation um, in 2020. Um, and in 2021, I also joined Vita Health Group um, as a remote rehabilitation therapist. So working on private medical insurance and occupational health clients um, through a online exercise based uh, rehab programs. Uh, so just moving on to a little bit of information about what amputee football is as a sport, because many people won't have heard um, of amputee football before. Uh, so amputee football is a disability sport for those with an amputation, congenital limb deficiency or restricted use of the limb. It was developed in the USA in the 1980s. And it's been played under the current format since 1998 by the seven founding members of the World Amputee Football Federation, uh, which are Argentina, Brazil, England, Russia, Ukraine, the USA, and Uzbekistan. Uh, the sport was discovered by accident uh, when the founder, uh, Don Bennett, uh, was watching his son play basketball uh, when the ball rolled away uh, and Don raised up onto his crutches, kicked the ball and the sport developed from there. And there are now over 50 nations and associations across the globe. The sport is a seven-a-side game played with six outfield leg amputees which who play on crutches and one arm or arm and leg amputee who plays in goal. The games are two 25-minute halves uh, and each team also gets a one-minute timeout per half um, and this is due to the um, extra load on crutches. Within the game there is also some adapted rules. Um, the first rule being that goalkeepers aren't allowed to leave their area due to having the advantage of being a two-legger um, and therefore the areas for goalkeepers are slightly larger than you would see in a typical seven-a-side pitch to give the goalkeeper a little bit of manoeuvrability, but also so they can't run around the full pitch. Uh, we get rolling substitutions to keep players fresh. Uh, and some of the key rules are around kind of the stumps and the residual limbs. So first rule is, a, is called crutch ball. And this essentially follows a similar rule into a handball where the crutch is classed as an extension of the arm. So if a player uses the crutch to hit the ball or if it hits the ball um, onto the crutch in an unnatural position, this would be given as a foul. Stump ball follows a very similar ruling. So if the ball hits their residual limb, um, if it's deemed in an unnatural position or if the player has intentionally let the residual limb hit the ball, also given as a foul, as this would be advantageous to players with longer stumps. Stump on the floor. Um, so this is if a player has a longer stump and they place their stump onto the floor to avoid falling over. This is given a as a foul because it would give an advantage to certain players over those with a higher amputation. Goalkeepers also aren't allowed to use their stump or residual limb as this can give an advantage to longer stumps, uh, similar to the outfield players. Um, and there is no entering or leaving the pitch during a timeout as the timeouts are still classified as regular gameplay. So players aren't allowed to leave the pitch and staff aren't allowed to enter the pitch of play. So we often have to treat whilst kind of divided uh, by the edge of the pitch. Amputee football in England has been run by the England Amputee Football Association, um, and this is a non-profit charitable organisation. As a charity, we provide amputees, people with congenital limb deficiencies and persons with restricted use of limbs with the opportunity to play football locally, nationally and internationally. We work with a national team, development squad, several club teams through our amputee football leagues and a junior programme to help all children join in the sport. We have a variety of players of all ages, and each player has their own unique story. They may have lost their limbs in different ways, came into the sport from different pathways, and it's a big part of our role as a staff member to support their journey and their needs around their amputation, not just in a sporting capacity, but also in day-to-day -day life and them growing as people within our group and our organisation. 
The crest for England amputee football, as you can see in the top corner, represents our ex-captain who embodied what it meant to be EAFA, supporting each other, promoting the sport and instilling our family values. It reminds us every time we wear the shirt that who we are as a charity and who we are as a team. And it gives us great pride to be able to wear the badge and represent him in every single thing we do as a club. Our voluntary team aim to provide the best programme in the world. Um, and if you want to find more information out about the England Amputee Football Association, then please see our website. So as I described earlier, initially for the travelling squad for the Euros, when I arrived, it was just me and Nile that travelled. When obviously when you travel with a squad, there's always parts of the medical team that get left behind. Mm -hmm. But like I explained, we were in a transitional phase and it was quite clear that we need to reflect a wider MDT approach within our medical setup to help improve the service that we provide our athletes and the overall professionalism and management. So our medical team currently encompasses of a team doctor, two physios, a sports rehabilitator, a sports therapist that was taken on um, in partnership with UCLan because technically they're a student because they're doing the sports medicine masters, um, a nutritionist, sports scientist and physical performance coach. So you can see um, our pathway links pretty much to the standards of the FA and Premier League standards. Like any professional medical team, we're always trying to seek that competitive edge on how we can reduce injury risk and incidences and improve our prehabilitation and conditioning in order to keep up with the full-time paid national teams because we're just a charity and obviously we're volunteering and we give a lot of time up for um, this charity so it's really important to us that we are able to compete and really provide elite professionalism and standards. So the season schedule the England Amputee season across all teams is only a nine month program. It runs from January to September, depending on the schedule of the international competition. So the Euros run um, every other year and the World Cup, like normal football, is every four years. As a national team program, we run very similar to any other national team training camps meeting monthly. We do a Friday through to a Sunday just out of ease because um, obviously we all work full time outside of this program. Um, so to get the time off work, it's a lot easier to do a weekend. So to assist with periodization, you can see that it's split into three phases and that's so that we can coordinate with the technical team on a loading perspective to in ensure training load parameters are met and athletes peak at the correct times according to our international fixtures and competitions. Because obviously we have at the very end of the season, the main event, so over a World Cup, or European Championship, but throughout that we'll have international fixtures and cup um, competitions scattered. So this season was the first cycle with the individual athletes that were selected for the training squad for the England national team. Um, it was quite a new team, so we have quite a, had quite a lengthy preparation and education phase compared to what was previously anticipated, as mm -hmm. we did travel with the youngest average squad to the World Cup, just to add some perspective. So hopefully next season it will look a little different as we have an off-season. There's no Euros or World Cup championships, but there will be the Nations League in Poland in June. So it will look quite different in our peaks and troughs and our loading compromisation um, moving into 2023. So we're quite lucky to have a very talented media team at the camps um, to capture all the work we do. So here's just a little snippet of the very beginning of the season in January when we did um, some pre-screening. We're going to pass you over to uh, Lev and Mev, who came in a second, and we're going to take you through the warm-up. Good report. Hold it! Boy! Turn yourself round. Backwards diagonals. Good luck, Bob Thomas Atkinson. Good keeping, good ults, let's go. Explosive! Drive up! Inch, get it, get it, Okay, so you need to get in groups of three. Can you mix up national team and next gen? Drive up!
So as a charity, we rely heavily on donations and sponsorships to be able to have access to all the expensive equipment that you might have seen little snippets of in that clip. For example, timing gates, we get those from UCLan from our partnership of taking students on and we do have GPS um, from Catapult or through mm. sponsorship. So the world of screening, as some of you may know, can be as complicated or as simple as you want to make it. And usually it's based on the equipment and expertise of the professionals you have at hand. Our main aim was time efficiency. Because like I said, we only train from a Friday to a Sunday once a month. And in that time, if you imagine, we're trying to do education as well as doing contact time with the ball and doing football stuff. So trying to also do pre-screening on that, it then becomes very tight for time. So we have quite short contact time and we wanted to focus on objective measures that can be used if the players were to get injured for baseline data and then to help individualise our SNC programme for the forthcoming season. Um, specifically, obviously, cardiovascular fitness is one of the key areas that we want to work on, which we'll discuss a bit later on, being an anaerobic sport. We do this in pre-screening through the yo-yo test, which is very evidence-based to link to amputee football. And then we also do three kilometre and 1.6 kilometre runs throughout the season, um, staged according to our periodisation and loading as to where we're at. Current data from Brazil shows that we are parallel with the range of scores and the distance collected from the yo-yo from the maximal outfield score being 1,440. And I've just put, we did it two different um, timings in the season. So we did January and then four months later with 11 players. So you can see the difference here in the scores that they got. Didn't include the goalkeepers just for obvious reasons because obviously they have both legs. So it would be a bit unfair comparison because um, their scores are obviously a lot better a lot further distance um, and then if you think about that and compared to an able-bodied person the average score of a yo-yo test is over 20 and we're reaching about stage nine so you can see the difference here um, of how fast or slow paced you think the game might be without even watching any football just to give further insight we also do the 505 for agility turn it off left and right foot we do 10 to 30 meter sprints with our timing gates rep max tests 60 seconds max endurance test and that's just to name a few we could sit all session and go over those but that's just a few uh, so here's just some of the current research uh, and statistics around amputee footballers that's currently out there uh, a lot of the anthrop anthropometric data is often quite varied in amputee football uh, due to the varied athlete profiles and their different amputee classifications as well uh, but we can see from the research that amputees show a higher heart rate uh, and that averages around 30 beats per minute higher um, and also having a higher half-time and post-game RPE uh, compared to non-disabled athletes, which does indicate higher energy expenditure in amputee football. This heart rate, however, is significantly lower than the predicted heart rate max. We can also see that amputee footballers show blood lactate levels of around five to six millimoles, uh, and this is very similar to that of able-bodied football players. Another research shows that the energy expenditure using crutches is around twice that of an athlete with standard gait. Moving on to our average game data, uh, the total distance covered by an outfield player during a game is on average five to six kilometres, which is half that of an able-bodied footballer. Um, but some of this could be attributed to the differences in game length, different way that we play the game, and also the size of pitch as well. Uh, the upper speed threshold is around 16.9 kilometres an hour per game, and this is around 10 kilometres slower than that of regular football players. There isn't unfortunately a lot of research out there at the moment on amputee football, and particularly not a lot looking at the sports science or quantitative data around player fitness or game data itself. We're hoping that we can start to undertake a little bit more research ourselves on amputee football data, as we've now been able to start collecting our own data through the use of catapult uh, and other means uh, as part of our pre-season testing. So we hope that in future seasons that we're gonna be able to put our own data out there um, and some of our, our own research. So this is um, a player's map from the catapult. So we have access to player tech pods, which is through our sponsorship, like we said before. So current evidence-based practice on training load overall in able body footballing or in training load full stop, it shows that there is no gold standard and evidence on GPS training, as Nat said, and loads in amputee football is even less 
um, out there. So we're currently working on some novel reports and articles to publish. So the data that we're showing here is all the raw data. It's obviously not broken down into the depth and the significant values that we will have um, when we go to publish. So this session that you can see here is a specific summary of a midfielder um, in an international fixture from the World Cup. So you can see it splits up and it gives them gives different details depending on what you wanted to look at. So the heat maps are really great. They get real good player buy-in and the arrows to show exertion levels. A lot of the players think um, like to see where they've worked hard and can often relate back to the game when we do one-to-one -one sessions with them so that they can, can see how hard they're working um, and they like to see those kind of things. At the top in the activity chart, you can see that it's got some quite sharp peaks and that it's quite up and down, quite spiky, we'd say, in trend of the data. Um, now, this is the raw clipping that I then clip according to the time to get um, our metrics. But as you can see, it's anaerobic in nature because it's constantly on and off and in that high intensity zone due to all the things that now just discussed before on the last slide. So if we go specifically into our raw World Cup data from our GPSs, you can see this is just taken from our averages from distance speed and distance per minute. We like to rank the players in top three. It helps with that competitive edge, you know, seeing who is there. And we like to see as well positionally if there's any change. Current data shows that there is no real um, correlation between position, speed or distance. But based on our team and the athletes that we have, I think when we publish and do our significant values, it will show that there is a correlation between positions and speed and distance. But previous research from Poland, Turkey, Brazil, they're not able to find that at the moment. But like I said, GPS data is quite low down there. So they covered seven games overall um, when we are at the World Cup. So you can see the total team distance was 168. Um, 0.47 kilometers so we took away um, a travel squad of 16 everyone got different minutes different times and that 16 also does include two goalkeepers so when we're saying the total team distance it doesn't break it down fully but we did take the top values to share with you today just so you can see compared to the evidence that we're able to discuss with you so top distance was from a midfielder and that was in one of our games against Argentina mm -hmm. They got 4.55 kilometres. Now, as we discussed, the data at the moment is five to six kilometres, but our clippings don't include warm up or extra time. It's generally just the pure game and it cuts out the half time as well. Top speed, we can see that it was um, again by a midfield position and they reached 7.07 .07 metres per second. And as you saw before, obviously this is metres per second, it's not kilometres per hour, but the game play is generally around 16 kilometres per hour. Mm -hmm. If we go off the player's fitness from the yo-yo test, we know they're able to reach that score through mm -hmm. the defender who got the very top end of the score. So we, our aim for next season is to get everyone within that 16 kilometres per hour to make our overall game and style of play a bit faster. And then you could see distance per minute and sprint distance. We're not going to go into too much detail over those because we're still working on what the overall pace of amputee football is and the metrics because obviously catapult is linked to able body football and able body metrics so there's still a bit of tweaking that we need to do in partnership with catapult and our sports science team so just moving on to biomechanics of amputee football now um so biomechanics is actually one of the main differences uh, between amputee football and mainstream able-bodied football uh, some of the key areas of difference we have is the the running gait and um, the running gait is unique to every single player so it's quite hard for us sometimes to analyze um, a lot of this is due to crutch height um, as you can see from some of the images there a lot of the players have different preferences of crutches down in the bottom left, we can see a slightly lower crutch, which allows the player to be lower to the ground, easier changes of direction. Um, and some players like to be higher up so they can give more of a presence in a defensive position. Uh, there is also a lot higher load through the arms than you would expect with the running gait of an able-bodied uh, player. We also have a lot of changes in stride length. Um, so we can go from a longer stride, to short, sharp uh, movements, depending on the style of play that's being um, undertaken at that time or the player position. One of the other big differences is the way that we kick the ball. The way that we kick a ball is more of a full body swing through, as you can see in some of the top images. 
rather than it just being a lower limb movement, there is core and torso movement within the kick through. And this allows for better generation of power and also better accuracy as well, particularly with having to try and get curl on the ball or placing the ball into a particular part of the pitch. Defending is also another change in terms of positioning. We can see changes in crutch position used to increase mobility, but also to give a wider presence in a defensive um, stance. A wide crutch stance is often allows for a better defensive position, but it does give um, more of a chance of giving away a foul, as mentioned in the rules. Crutch ball is given quite often in amputee football, particularly if the crutch is deemed by the referee as being in an unnatural position. And unfortunately, as it is with handballs in the regular game, there's a lot of controversy around what's a handball and what's a not handball. Same with crutch balls. Um, so a lot of referees do deem that a wide stance is unnatural, even though it's actually probably one of the most natural defensive positions for amputee football. Another big difference is the load distribution throughout the body. Um, so we can see in amputee football that there is a higher upper body load distribution, and therefore it's actually quite even between the lower and upper body compared to regular football. Goalkeeper saves are also quite different. So we can see on the last side and just in the bottom corner of this slide um, that the goalkeepers due to the one arm have to either save um, in a slightly different manner, also involving saving across their body. This often involves learning different techniques on how to save the ball, particularly saving across the body and diving across to the opposite side of the neck on their quote unquote weaker side. Uh, and proprioception is another big part of our biomechanics that we work on. Uh, the proprioceptive differences are quite large in comparison to able-bodied football. And this is because of the single leg loading, the changes in the center of body mass, um, even whilst moving up on the crutches, and also the proprioceptive feedback from the crutches, particularly when we're on a single crutch or when the leg is in the air. So we can see in a lot of these images here, here either when players are trying to clear the ball, if they're trying to kick the ball, they're often balanced on either one crutch or two crutch. And in extreme circumstances like the bottom middle picture, um, they're almost at 90 degrees parallel to the crutches. And this involves a lot of training around their proprioception and the feedback they get from the crutches as well. So we've just got a short video now just to show you some of the biomechanics in play, um, some of the fit footage from our recent World Cup um, tournament. Um, and it's just going to give you a little bit of an idea of the sport as well um, in its kind of natural sense. Um, so I'll just play that for you now. <laughs> As you can see from the video there, just some really good examples of changes of direction, um, shots on goal, 
um, the play, the build-up play, um, and how quickly they can turn on the crutches, as well as the different styles of running. So you'll see that some of the players had quite a um, straight gait, so their body stays quite central, and some of them have a slight preference to one side, and that's usually due to the side of their amputation and those unique biomechanics that they've learned through their time in amputee football. And so ahead of this season, um, we started undergoing a little bit of analysis on some of the top players in the sport uh, and it, within our team ourselves, uh, and to look to identify some key areas we could improve our biomechanics to help give us a competitive edge. Each player, as we said, has their own unique way of running, their own unique biomechanics. So therefore, the aim of this analysis wasn't to change their biomechanics, but to optimize them um, and to be able to improve their performance. And we did this through our key areas of crutch mobility, control, agility. Um, and these were identified as our key areas of optimization. We began a program of drills to work on the improved biomechanics. And this included sharp changes of direction, single crutch running, side running, running at speed in multiple directions, and the switching between different from one crutch to the other crutch, so almost an alternation um, between crutches like bounding. Um, the aim here was to promote confidence and to allow players to naturally be able to switch their biomechanics to suit the players best possible and to be adaptable throughout the game. Within two months, we started to see progress and adaptation within our players. And by the time it came around to the tournament, a lot of these adaptations were, were set in stone. We had some really natural changes in the games, uh, which actually improved our performance for some of the big games that we had at this tournament. And we plan to continue this work into the next season and future seasons to further progress and adapt our players to give us the most competitive edge on the biomechanics as we possibly can. Uh, moving on to injury prevalence now. Um, so as with any team sport, there is higher injury rates than that of individual sports. Um, but it can also be assumed that with amputee footballers, they're prone to the same types of injuries as able-bodied competitors, along with some increased risk injuries due to external factors, such as equipment difference. So with crutches, um, the amount of times that we get injuries related to being either hit with a crutch um, uh, or tangling crutches up, um, arm injuries due to the cuffs as well. Uh, there's a change of the playing surface, so often at tournaments we can end up playing sometimes on grass, sometimes on astroturf, and this quick adaptation does sometimes lead to loading issues, um, as has been shown in previous studies um, across all sports of the changes between astroturf um, and soft ground. Uh, and intense schedules as well. Because of the nature of the sport, it's very voluntary across the world, with only a couple of nations actually professional and semi-professional. Our tournaments are very, very intense. We play a lot of games in short spaces of time. So, for example, our league fixtures are all done over a weekend and teams play within four or five fixtures across that weekend. And similarly, in the tournaments, we tend to play nine games in around a, a seven to eight day period um, in some of our kind of big major tournaments. This does have a higher intensity and less time for us to recover as well. A recent study done this year by the Polish national team on their, on their 25 man squad um, show that there was a 48% incidence in 100 athletes um, from their data. Um, they did found that there was an injury prevalence was linked to predisposing factors such as age, sex, body composition, the climate, um, surface on the playing ground, and also the equipment um, compared to that of able-bodied football. Um, but their, their research did have a 95% confidence interval, um, and that was done throughout their nine-month season across their team there. Um, from our research, we can see that there are a lot of other common risk areas, so particularly things like the shoulder complex due to that increased load on the crutches, um, ankle and perineal injuries due to the changes of the centre of body mass, foot positioning and proprioception, and then lumbar pelvic region due to the instabilities and changes of load um, and the support from the amputation. So often players having a pelvic dip because we do have a lot of players that day to day wear prosthetics, um, but then when they come to the sport on the crutches, so their balance and their control of the lumbar pelvic isn't always as good as those players who don't wear prosthetics um, full time. What we do to reduce our injury rates is a lot of functional screening, our pre-season testing as we went through earlier in the presentation. Um, and injury, injury reduction in this population is really, really important, particularly in our squad, um, just because of the impact on the individual's daily activities. Um, as they're all in voluntary players, just as the staff are, and we try to make sure that it has the least impact on their daily lives, um, as well as their time out from injury in the sport as well. And um, because a lot of them use it as a really good mental benefit for them um, and just getting out playing football. So here we can start looking into some of the injury analysis from our season and the data that we're going to publish. 
So we're very lucky to have a sponsorship with Train My Athlete. Some of you may have heard of them. They're an incredible software that you can use from a medical and sports science point of view. So literally anything you can think of goes on this software. So your medical notes, um, your injury analysis, availability, screening data, and it correlates it all and then produces very nice tables like this, as you can see. So it shows you the body part, injuries, days lost, training lost, game, um, and those that have it a reoccurring injury now this is really crucial to look at as a summary for the end of the season that we've come to now that it's a close after the world cup ready to think about things that are little those little changes we can make for our injury prevalence and screening um to get that competitive edge so we just pick out a few um here the number of athletes this is based on is about 18 because we've had a few interchangeable players we obviously only take away 16 um, to the World Cup. So you can see that um, the shoulder had two injuries. Now, when you look at days lost, it says 590. That's because it correlates both players' days. So that's why it looks like it's over a year lost. But it's not. You've got to obviously split it into respective of each player that was injured. One of those we're not too concerned about as such because it's a degenerative issue of a shoulder and they came predisposed with that and it wasn't picked up in training or a game, whereas the other one was impact injury. So that's something we'll look at going forward. The other thing that people obviously think that people get a lot of shoulder injuries. So we work really hard on our prehabilitation and we do, we might have seen in the pre-screening video, we do banded exercises every single session um, before and obviously have really focused cool downs. But as now said, a lot of our players actually use crutches outside of the game as well, just because the biomechanics and gait pattern of using crutches rather than a prosthesis and then having to swap to just being a crutch user only in the game can um, make it a bit hard work and that would again give you that competitive edge so because of the load through both it's actually quite equal and they're not that predisposed to loading and um, shoulder issues but obviously because the crutches are involved they are um, exposed to maybe some higher risk injuries from external stimuli and factors so another one that a lot of people might surmise injury wise that they get is to do with your ankles because obviously they're only ambulating um, on one leg so the ankles we had seven injuries overall if you could include um left and right one was non-contact um and based off that injury we've done some um mdt and medical work in a reflection and there's plenty of things that we can put going forward with proprioception and adding some extra s and c things in next season but six of them were contact injuries so it's not necessarily something that we'll be too concerned about um but we'll look into it going forward as to if there was anything um if it was to do with ground texture if the ground was quite hard or equally too um too wet too soft which caused a few more contact injuries with slipping and sliding or if it was generally just a hard tackle which is something that we can look at with the referees then if we look at our head injuries because that's also quite significant because it's seven but actually only had 38 days lost. That's because there was only actually one concussion in there where we followed the concussion protocol and the rest were facial lacerations. As we said, obviously having crutches involved and when you're jumping for headers um, with crutches, it, people are varying heights and depending where your crutch arm comes up to when you then go to header or even come in contact and bounce off, crutches do go flying um, quite a lot of the time. So there's quite a lot of lacerations, mainly facial, um, to do with those. When you look at the injuries overall, this is obviously over a nine month period and it only includes 16 to 18 players. So we're quite confident that our incident rate is going to be quite low um, when we do our um, statistical analysis that we will then publish. So I think it's looking quite good for us. Then if we look at the, how this translates into our availability, so another brilliant chart that's produced from Train My Athlete. So those that are injured, but can't train and those that are injured that can train obviously get um, put into a data chart that we can then look at. So the red is obviously um, where no one's been training or no one's available. So we look at January through to October and it's nice to see that it actually correlates perfectly with our training load programme that we did. So I'll explain that to you. So January, obviously we start pre-season and we start loading the players and we start getting really heavy so you can see that february march and april it's quite normal to pick up a few um knocks or one or two injuries which most 
real in reality are related to load um, and increasing um, the training load that we do to then get us prepared for our competition phase because this is in the education and preparation phase that we discussed within our season schedule and then it's nice to see that reflected um, with the red markers of those who were not available and had injuries June, July, August, September as so we're coming into our competition load it was very minimal um, compared to what we had the months before so that we had maximum um, selection and priority to pick for our 16-man squad and it's nice to see obviously that it reflects exactly what we were aiming for in training load considering there's no data out there um, and that we're just going off what our novel GPS data is saying our raw data so it's nice to see that things have worked out into practice there. Uh, so just moving on to a little bit of a case study now um, from one of our injuries. Um, so this was a right foot uh, tib post tendinopathy repetitive strain injury. Uh, the player was first assessed three weeks post injury. Uh, the mechanism, mechanism of injury uh, was the player was playing for their club team in a tournament against a walking football team. Uh, they played several games in the space of one weekend um, and they played a large amounts of minutes in those games as well. Uh, as we said before, this is quite common in amputee football um, due to the voluntary nature. We play very intense schedules um, in a short space of time. Um, after the pain initially started, uh, the pain was intermittent and would usually come on after training or after games. Um, through the assessment, um, as you can see on the, on the slide there, um, so the active movements, we showed a little bit of discomfort in plantar flexion and inversion, but full range of movement. Uh, their resisted movements uh, did identify a little bit of discomfort during resisted inversion, um, but it was good strength in relation to the other ankle movements. Um, now with amputees, it can be quite difficult sometimes measuring range of movement and strength because we don't have another side to compare against with some um, injuries. Uh, so in this case, we couldn't compare against the other side um, with the ankle. So we have to kind of use the range of movement in relation to what we know of the players um, and their kind of normal range of movement that we'd expect and also their strength in comparison to the other movements as well. Um, also, in terms of this particular injury, we were able to differentiate as a tib post injury due to palpation. Um, so the only area of, of the tenderness through palpation was around the distal tib post tendon um, going kind of into the midfoot. Um, so this differentiated from FHL tendinopathies as well because there was nothing going underneath the foot or down into the toes as well. Treatment wise, we did a lot of soft tissue work into the calf because it did have calf tightness as well, and particularly into the tib post muscle belly. Frictions to the distal tib post tendon, um, and this was done regularly throughout their training weekends, um, and they did some friction away from training weekends as well, when we weren't unfortunately able to see the player in person. Um, and then rehab wise, the, the player was fine to continue with training as we were in the middle of our season, so we had no competitive games. So we were able to train in moderation alongside an optimal loading progressive program. Uh, so here's just a few examples of the rehab program that we were doing. So kind of some of our key exercises. And um, so you can see from the first section, and um, this was our initial program that we started with. We started with some really key activation exercises around the ankle and the other tendons in the area. Um, and also in the latter stages of that program, we had some optimal loading through the tip post. Um, as they improved, we started to increase their loading. Um, as indicated by most rehab protocols and obviously with tendons we want to optimally load the tendon so into our second program we we use some of the similar exercises but increasing their repetitions to increase the optimal load and to work into a little bit more of muscular endurance and tolerance in the tendon as well as they were responding really really well we also started to introduce some optimal plyometric loading as well and a lot of um, changes of direction changes of movement as well there the patient was responding really, really well to rehab and they were recovering well within a six to eight week period. And um, they were just about pain free and comfortable when they unfortunately did get a concussion uh, and did have to go into concussion protocol. Um, so that kind of was about when they were joining into their um, full return to play with no restrictions. And when they returned from the concussion protocol and the full return to play through concussion, the issue had fully resolved and it was monitored through their return to play from the concussion as well. So as we just summarise now for our future plans and what we see now that our 2022 season has come to an end and we look to go into 2023. So our next big step is our transition into the FA. So obviously we're a charity at the moment, but we'll be hoping to align with the Football um, Association and they're going to take over ready for the 2024 Euro squad announcement, which will be after the League Nations in June 2023. 
within that we'll take forward our EA for culture we've worked so hard on as EA for family to build and work on looking into our game plan for the competitive edge from a medical and technical perspective with some real focus from our side on biomechanics I think we've spoke about that quite heavily in this um presentation because that is where we feel that we can make a real difference and get our competitive edge like we say um, amputees use a twofold energy expenditure when they're on the pitch um, compared to ourselves and we're just walking around because obviously you're using crutches so if we can improve that and maximize on that then we can definitely make some um, real good gains and of course if they would get better with their biomechanics you'd hope that would correlate with reducing injury rates and then continue competing with the leading nations so that is um the end that's just a little tiny snippet as to the kind of things that we're doing at the england amputee football association now as you know it is a charity so of course we rely heavily on donations and sponsorship so if anyone is able to donate on the back of this presentation big or small you can use the qr code that is on here if you scan with your phone now um, or you can head over to our website if you're interested, have a little look, and there is obviously links there. And um, we've obviously got social pages, so I do apologise. I think there are some lag in some of the videos. So if you are quite keen and just want to have a little look at some of the biomechanics, um, the Instagram page is great for that, and have a little look at um, our World Cup that we've just recently been to. And we're on all platforms. And we'd just like to thank everyone for listening, and thank you, Ollie and Basra. That's a pleasure. <clears throat> thank you so much, guys, for that presentation. That was awesome. Um, we've had loads of questions coming in um, that Owen has very been kindly fielding for us because uh, a lot of them have been non-rehab or medical related questions, which is really cool. People wanting to know more about the sport. I can see Gary in there as well <clears throat> um, responding to some of those questions. So we'll work through we'll work through some of them now. Uh, and if if people still in with us do have any additional questions, please keep posting them and keep reviewing what's there. Um, I'll start with, um, with Robert's question just because it's, it's the one right in front of me. Um, how do you monitor players' rehab and progress when you're in between training camps? Uh, so we, we mostly monitor rehab um, through WhatsApp group chats um, and through kind of one-to-one -one work with the players. And we do also use um, uh, online rehab principles. So we'll get video calls with players sometimes, um, have regular calls. Some of us are in similar areas to some of the players, so we can sometimes meet with the players um, and through the league fixtures. So the way that we usually have our schedule is um, we'll have a England weekend once a month um, and then kind of alternating with that, we have the league fixtures. Um, so at those league fixtures, we do also have that interaction with players. So sometimes I'll get players to come down that are injured um, just so they can be assessed at the league weekends as well there. Um, but away from that, it's a lot of remote work, a lot of contact through WhatsApp um, and just sending out programmes regularly, getting feedback from them there. Yeah. yeah, and then through an objective point of view, we obviously have trained by athlete, so we can upload programmes onto there and they can give RPE and daily wellness scores through that so we can monitor them, how they're feeling and their um, injury um, recovery from that. And also we have polar heart rate monitors that we track and score and we use them for our injury and also for normal season training to confirm that they are obviously doing the sessions that we're asking them to do um, from a loading point of view. Is that a requirement for them as well that they <clears throat> that they track their wellness scores when they are yeah. away from camp? So you get in yeah. regular data, and it allows yeah. us um, we can re weekly monitor that. Um, and if it does flag up with any um, kind of issues, we can contact the players, um, and it just allows us to keep that level of contact. Um, and if there are things that are bothering them, whether it be injuries or anything mentally as well, uh, we can support them and, and signpost them in different directions if needed as well. Cool. And there's only one other question so far that's not already been answered by Owen or, or Gary. They're doing the, I think, I think they've earned a brew after this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me just find it again. Uh, it's a question from Isabella. So um, have there been any missing links in the rehab process uh, that you've identified between amputee football and able-bodied football? So I guess things that you find uh, more difficult, more challenging, things that you'd like to do that you can't. I think the, the big difference is time for us um, because we are voluntary and because we, we only get a small amount of contact time and we need to split that between uh, injury prevention, but also technical side as well. Um, we just don't have the amount of time. So for example, with the biomechanics, the program we were able to put in place this year only just scratched the surface of what we, what we could be able to do um, with time and facilities. 
Um, similarly with the rehab, uh, with some of the injuries, we probably would be able to slightly reduce our kind of time out if we were able to see the players a lot more regularly. Um, and then because of their daily life as well, they have to go to work. That can have an impact on their injury uh, recovery times as well. So I think that for us is, is time and resources is, is the big thing um, that's our kind of area that we, we could hopefully improve in the future. Yeah, Niall's hit the nail on the head there. I guess the missing links are, one, the financial resources. So we've always got to adapt and overcome those. And realistically, it's very easy to do. Like the programme that we've been able to implement and if you actually generally just make it your um, pre-screening simple and pick the go back to basics and pick the basic kind of things. You don't need to be videoing the counter movement jumps and analysing it all and going right down to the angles and of the transverse loads and all that kind of stuff. If you've only got so much contact time and they're obviously doing club stuff as well, it's more that because it's only weekend stuff and high load, whereas obviously your Chelsea players, for example, will be in throughout the week and then they'll have access to incredible um, facilities and equipment. You've got to take it step back again and just say oh well what can we do with the resources and the people that we've got so we rely heavily on the people hence why you might look and think our medical team is huge for a volunteer team and it's because we generally are a little army and we all work together and as Dan says we signpost and we have a range of um, people with different experience who've worked in different levels all the way like right up from Premier League clubs all the way down um, to the bottom and, and everyone can just bring a different idea so I guess it's the link missing the links that we pick up are through the people and um, we just bounce off each other that way yeah <clears throat> and resource is massive I suppose that's that's a good opportunity for me to employ employ anybody watching um if you are able to please make a donation to support these guys and the work that they're doing because they've, they've given up the time for us <laughs> this evening to put on this session um, and obviously everybody's here everybody's here for free so if you are able to support the cause um, and support the team that would be massively appreciated i believe uh, correct me if i'm wrong it's as easy as scanning the qr code on the screen at the minute yeah should be we try to stop it so <laughs> <laughs> awesome so go and do that please guys um a couple more questions that are coming in have you linked any particular biomechanical patterns with specific injuries so things like crutch position or or things like that, and then are you able to tweak them to reduce injury risk? Uh, one of the things really with the, the biomechanics was the changes of direction, the change of um, loading through the crutches. Um, and I think the big thing there with injury prevention is, is down to the rotator cuff control. If we can improve their adaptability from um, being able to change direction, whether it's running side on um, with the kind of crutches almost like sort of twisted one in front, one behind, being able to change direction very sharply, that can lead to a lot of risks of um, kind of rotator cuff irritations, tears, and in worst case scenarios, even dislocations. Um, but for ourselves, if we're able to promote and improve their control, the muscles can tolerate that much better. Um, and we did see decreases in the amount of kind of irritable shoulders. We did have a player kind of earlier in the season who had a lot of irritation around the shoulders. He was very kind of anteriorly rotated. And as it came through the season, as he did some progressive work with some exercises and the crutch program, didn't seem to have any issues in the latter games. It actually played really well throughout the tournament as well and had no issues that he would have had in a previous season with us not doing that work in there. Um, so it is kind of more prevention of injuries through uh, improved tolerance as well. Yeah, and I think one area that I identified as well through one of the ankle injuries were they landed straight back onto their ankle and didn't use their crutches. So if we can, if you think about the external factors, obviously that predispose you to injury risk. So obviously it's the surface of the, the ground that you're playing on, the opposition and like what kind of game it is. If you then have to land on something that is in your own body, so like your crutches, if we can then get them used to that motor sensory pattern of using the extension of the crutches to land um, then that can help a lot with the reducing the risk of injury too and it's more about the adaptability to all the different um, exposure and stimuli that they're faced with so we're trying to do a lot of stuff like uh, now I said with your lateral running with your crutches in front of you and getting them a lot more comfortable on single crutch use so you might have seen in the biomechanic photos there was a few of players um, like doing unicycle kicks and stuff like that um, which you can do with just on your one crutch 
and also like headers and things like that. So they can get used to that through the load of the shoulder as well as the landing mechanics through the foot. And um, I think that will really help. We've also done a lot of work on improving um, cardiovascular um, tolerance as well. So improving aerobic and anaerobic capacity. And this has decreased our fatigue related injuries as well. So the latter stage of the games, we're getting less cramp um, related pains. Players are allowed to play, able to play large amounts of minutes without needing to come off um, the in previous seasons. So a lot of the work on aerobics as well has, has really helped reduce our, our injury rates. I, I had a question. I was saving one in the bank. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are a couple of others that I want to get to, but I had a question about CV training, actually. And do, do the lads um, do all of their cardiovascular fitness training sort of on the pitch or on land with the crutches? Or are they using equipment, adapted equipment? What's the, what's the situation? They use a wide variety. So it, a lot of it comes down to player preference. So some do like to just go run on the pitch. Um, some like to go and just do runs on the streets. Um, and then a lot that are quite have a big buy into the gym programs use a lot of kind of adaptive stuff. So um, on the bikes, um, rowing machines, um, swimming. And a lot of that is, is more personal preference than anything else. We do yeah. encourage them to use a larger variety for cross training, uh, which obviously has better benefits than just training exactly the same every time. Yeah. We also have a lot of players that play other sports as well. And um, due to the nature of disability sport, a lot of them have tried different things. And um, so a few do play other sports and get a different cardio input from those as well. Yeah, awesome. so we really have to do a three kilometre run and a 1.6 kilometre run based off the data that we do. And they are mandatory that you have to do them on crutches they're a time thing yeah that's <clears throat> that's impressive <laughs> 3k on crutches is seriously well, the impressive they do, they do more than that in a game so yeah yeah um on that point actually you, you teed up one of the questions perfectly there um you showed a heat map of a midfielder earlier yeah. how different are the heat maps for players in different positions and how like how much variance is there in those those depends. heat maps? And are some more likely to get injured than others? So, do you see more injuries in your midfielders, for example? Um, the correlation we've not done it statistically, but I can tell you from the raw data that we've got, it is the midfielders that get um, more of the contact injuries because they have more time with the ball just because mm -hmm. of the way um, we play through the technical team decisions they'll have more time with the ball and do a lot more running so they're almost like targeted for um, their skills and if they're running with the ball obviously they're going to have a higher um, rate of tackles our defenders are more um, predisposed to the contact injuries for example like your face or lacerations and your landing mechanics um, forwards didn't really have as many injuries. No, um, previous data they've they've tried to correlate injuries to positions, and nothing's come up significant. But I think our data, I'll be shocked if our data doesn't show um, a significant p value. To be honest, um, yeah. just based on the stuff that we already know. Yeah, it's different. really good. <laughs> it's really yeah. thorough. Uh, and the di difference with the heat maps is is mainly due to the sport. So with the sport, the positions aren't quite as set as they are with able-bodied football. So there's a lot of adaptability. Um, in one of the videos, you could see one of the players coming around um, and making a last-ditch tackle. That's actually one of our winger players who was then running into defence. And um, so our, our winger players also play almost as fullbacks at points. Um, in some of our kind of tactical things, we do have switches of play. So midfielders drop back into defence. Defenders can kind of move forwards and a lot of our players are expected to be able to play multiple positions so their heat maps can really vary um, and we, we don't see kind of as big a differences as you do in able-bodied football and especially with the size of the pitch as well. Yeah, yeah. because the size of the pitch is quite small but if I did show you a photo like showed you three photos you would be able to guess has an educated guess as to what position they're playing. Yeah and um, I'll, I'll do one final question we have just hit nine o'clock but um, I can't seem to find it. So apologies to the person that asked this question. I think I've deleted it by accident, but um, it was a question around rehab compliance. And is that something that you struggle with? Do they tend to be better than um, the able body populations that both of you guys work with? What's the, we, what are they like? We, we do find it difficult um, sometimes just due to the nature of, because we don't see them very often. Um, but I think we've we've had a lot better buy-in this season um, with certain players than previous seasons. And a lot of that is due to our education that we've done. Um, and as we've gained an understanding of players, uh, so certain players that you, you might expect maybe aren't particularly good with the rehab, 
making sure that their programs are a lot more condensed so they don't feel like they're having to do too much. And then you get some players that are really bought into everything that we do. Um, and with them, you can increase that rehab a lot more. Um, but it, it's, it's adapting to the players. And I think we have had a better buy-in this year um, just because of some of the work that we've done and the education for the players as well. Awesome. Um, any closing comments from you guys? Because we, we won't take any more questions. So um, anything else to anything to throw in before we wrap things up? Uh, just just to thank everyone for, for listening this evening. And if you did want to learn any more about the sport, um, reach out to us on the socials. Um, we've got obviously videos out there. Um, and if you ever do get a chance to come and see a game, I'd always recommend it to anybody. Um, I fell in love with the sport from the moment I saw it. Um, and I've never left for four and a half years. So I think if any actually got a chance to watch the sport properly, um, you'd fall in love straight away. Yeah, Brilliant. I completely agree with now. Um, it's incredible the things that they're doing here at this charity. Um, and I think until you actually watch amputee football, mm. you won't understand how technical and how much demand demanding it is. And it is a real good sport to watch and get into. So even if you just want to have a little watch, go ahead. Awesome. Guys, thank you so, so much for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been a great presentation. It's been great to learn more about the sport um, and, and what goes into looking after these guys at an elite level. So thanks very much for being generous with your time and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Um, to everybody that is still online with us, when you do leave, I think you're going to be automatically directed to a feedback survey. So if you could take 30 seconds to fill that out for us, that would be incredibly useful. Um, we'll send you all the information out that you need in a follow-up email. Bear with us for a couple of days while we get that all together. Um, and we'll see you again on another one of our webinars soon. Uh, this is going to end us very abruptly. <laughs> so, um, Elizabeth and Niall, I'll say thanks very much once again. And uh, I'll catch up with you guys soon. Yeah, thank you. Yes.